getting live on YouTube here. Hopefully that's going to work. Man, technology, man. I have to say we really relied on technology so much this last couple of months. Only at a couple of times where it didn't work. Yeah, but it's, I think it's done amazingly well. You know what? I have to say it has. It has. I think I think uh, I could see so many reasons why it wouldn't. And so so far it has. So, OK, listen, we, we have uh, we have people visiting already. And I'm going to actually get uh, Gustavo here to uh, move you to a panelist, my friend. And I just screenshotted something, Angie. OK, sir. Perfect. Hava, why don't you uh, why, why don't you just uh, start the conversation going, man, with uh, with life? Hava was a very very unique story here, Mexican who uh, who we met, who met me in Costa Rica, surfing, <laughs> and right. then ends up in Canada, and now That's now right. is working in, now is working in uh, in uh, in Newfoundland. So I mean, in Newfoundland and, on and the east coast, literally surfing, surfing with um, with icebergs. I mean, like, go figure. Like, this is this is like a, a story that you can't even make up, Pavel. No, not really. Yeah, I wouldn't even believe it myself if I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Any advice for those that are kind of uh, thinking about, you know, the, their future? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, first of all, um, stick true to who you are. I think uh, that's sort of like, you know, looking back into what, uh, you know, led me to you. As you well know, um, Ike was a keynote speaker at a, the National Costa Rica Ophthalmology Society meeting. And I was there doing a very minor thing for residents. But in all honesty, the great attractive back then for me of going to Costa Rica was because the surf is great, right? So there was a, a two for one ophthalmology plus surfing deal and it sounded amazing in my two passions. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, Ike was uh, looking for drugs, so he came to me. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, Ike actually heard that I was a surfer, and he was interested in in, in surfing. Um, he's, he's always been like keen on the board sports and everything. So that's how we actually started chatting, and and then we obviously got into the ophthalmology conversation much more than surfing, really. But um, I think that kind of sparked a, a good friendship. Later on on the road, Ike invited me to Canada to do a uh, three-week uh, elective with him, which was the most incredible, mind-opening, mind-blowing time of my ophthalmology career. Um, and then afterwards, I was offered the uh, initially research fellow and then clinical fellow position with him, which is the most incredible experience ever, and basically skyrocketed my career. Uh, after which I had the opportunity to uh, stay here in Newfoundland and well, move to Newfoundland and stay in Canada. So I think if I am to give advice to anyone, it's follow your dreams, believe in yourself. And I think that's one thing that you like, gave me a lot of is, is helping me believe in myself and my, in my potential. And I think we all have the same potential, but a lot of us get, get stepped on, get, get, get stumped by it people who at that point in life we consider to be authorities or better than us. And, and, and you have an incredible quality, which is basically bringing out the best in people. And I think you did that for me, really. You, you sort of like made me believe in myself. So, so my best advice to everyone else is believe in your capacity because you are much greater than you think. That's a great story, man. Great words, Avo. I mean, I, I learned from you, man. It's uh, it's, it's, it's a great story. I love, I always love hearing it and it's not over yet. We, uh, not over yet. <laughs> More from you, and, and we appreciate you being here. So we're we'll get started. I think we um we uh we have uh everybody here, and uh, it's actually a nice tight group. I want to send greetings from Jeb Ong, who usually you see uh, introducing the panelists and the speakers. And uh, Jeb is un unavailable today. Uh, he has some family things to attend to, so uh, you have me to kind of try to organize things, and I'll try to keep it uh, running at least technologically. We'll see how it goes. Uh, we're focusing on on cataract today. Um, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to have with me, uh, Jordi Calzada, who's, uh, becoming a regular here. And it's a pleasure to have him as a regular guy, uh, who, um, who I think we all know very well in the, uh, in the retina and anti segment and all kinds of worlds, saving us, of course, from challenges. And both of us are going to cover, are going to cover, um, you know, different spectrums. And I'm, I'm going to talk more about, you know, cataract, uh, from, a you know, perspective of, uh, of, you know, little, little pearls and little tidbits that hopefully some of you will find useful. 
uh, from the beginner to maybe the more advanced. Uh, I, I am going to stick to regular FACO. I'm not going to show really, really wacko cases. We've done that before. We'll do it again. But uh, there's been a lot of requests from some of you to kind of talk about just, you know, hey, listen, what, what's, what's the usual, what's the routine, and how do you make things more efficient? And then we got, we got the disasters coming up with Jordy. So Jordy's going to be, uh, <laughs> be speaking about disasters. So we're looking forward to that, man. I feel, like, I, feel like, uh, I feel like we better start with mine first before you come on. Otherwise, after you come on, I may end up, you know, just stopping. Um, so it's going to be, I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, we, uh, and as you all know, Jordy is uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. Originally from Panama and a supremely talented retinal surgeon, educator, philosopher, thinker. If you follow him on social media and Instagram, you'll, you'll see some of his, uh, his thought processes and, and he loves to share. So um, we, we appreciate you being here, Jordi. You're, I, feel like, I feel like you and I are kind of, it's a natural connection, man. So Thank you, I can, I'm so proud and, and appreciative for being here. Wonderful platform. Thank you, brother. And uh, I, I want to just, again, this is Havo. This is Havo Surfing. So, Havo, thank you for, <laughs> uh, for being one of the panelists here today. Uh, you know, both, both sessions uh, contribute, um, interrupt, and, and chat. And, again, those that are on the, ch on the chat group, please ask questions as well. I also want to bring on Gustavo. I don't know. I hope, this, I hope this is you, man. I don't recognize you here, but I pulled up a picture. <laughs> Gustavo you, is a very, cl you. very class act here. Um, yeah. Brazilian mobster. Yeah, do you, want, do, you want to, do you want to explain the story, Gustavo? From Gustavo, by the way, is Brazilian, and he, he I think he's a master of uh, so many areas. I, I, I've, I've gotten to know Gustavo more during COVID. Actually, uh, he's brought us together. Actually, in, in the web, in the on the webinar scene, and uh, he's a, he's a master organizer. He keeps one keeps uh, moving and going, and uh, always uh, always really uh, focused on on teaching and visualization and documentation and recording. Fun guy. I, I look forward to doing more things with you, buddy. But thank you for joining us here and being, being part of the group. How are you doing, man? Tell us a story about this picture. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening or good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. First of all, thank you, Jordi, for inviting me. Thank you, Ike, for organizing these webinars. They are always trip away class. And this history, actually, I like cigars. And this was a wedding of a friend. And I really wanted, you know, my uh, Henning Leone picture. And that picture made me very famous. So sometimes when I have a, a strong webinar like today, I should put this picture. But you did the, the job for me. Thank you, Ike. <laughs> but but thank by the way, here, here's, a, here's something. Have you guys noticed? All of us are wearing heavy COVID beards. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Actually, actually about, about this picture, sorry. I, I'm going to ask you a favor you cannot refuse. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's just, just coming up, my friend. Yeah, I, I, uh, I appreciate you being here, Gustavo. Again, you know, please uh, jump in, feel free. Um, I, I, I know that you're, uh, you know, you've got great skills and, and, and Jordi, uh, presentation will be very useful to have all our discussion sure. on it. And I, and I know that, I don't know if Andrea is able to join us. Uh, if she is here, please message us. Um, she's a uh, Uruguayan who's in Spain, who's uh, also, as a connection with Superstar, that's how you know about her, Jordy, right? So yes, it's Paraguayan. Uh, she Par Paraguayan, in sorry. And, and works in Switzerland. She's an amazing surgeon, super, super smart, and a great pianist. Wow, okay. Well, we'll see if she brings out her piano. And, and if An Andrew does join us, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing her. So we'll, we'll look for her in the panelist group. Uh, Jordy, if you see her, let me know. We can, we, can, uh, we can get her as a panelist here, too. Okay, good. So that's basically our introducing our group we have with us. It's, uh, it's a nice, nice, nice group here together, and, um, and we will get started. Uh, I will say that, you know, we're, we're kind of, you know, thinking about where we're going with our webinars. We've been doing them twice a week now for <laughs> two and a half months. Uh, I realize people are getting back to work. Um, things are getting kind of uh, moving along and we're kind of just deciding, you know, you know, not so much should we do. I think we want to do webinars, but how often we should do them, when the right time should be. So uh, as you're kind of chatting and, and um, thinking about it, feel free to let us know. Let me know what you think. And we'll email folks as well um, just about what, what maybe the right way to do this would be. But we're we're here today. We're we're here. It's Wednesday, six p.m. Uh, I just finished a day of surgery, uh, and uh, and now we're here doing webinars. And I'm doing talking about tips and tidbits. And these are my disclosures. This actually this actually picture was from today. It's always funny sometimes when you're just you know finishing a case. This was an iris sutured lens, and uh, putting. So I often put some air in, you know, just to kind of keep the chamber, you know, formed. Uh, you can tell me how much viscous is in the eye, and and lo and behold, I got this nice little pattern like a bear like a bear paw print. So I thought you know that'd be kind of fun to show. 
Um, and all, all my non-ophthalmology friends are kind of aghast at like, what, what the hell, this is this eye's gonna explode. But we all know, of course, that's not the issue and it's kind of neat to see that. So I, I just wanna just start off just talking about some of the principles here. And, you know, we've heard a lot talking about this in terms of, you know, as we approach surgery, I, I'm gonna get into really the more of the physical uh, parts of the surgery, but I do wanna make sure we talk about the importance of imagination and visualization. I think it's such a powerful tool uh, it's our superpower we have, and 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 we can really use it uh, effectively to uh, plan and 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 you know perform cases. And I think you know the real the real surgeons here. I think on on this board here, I can tell you, you've got the surgeon surgeon. These guys just just you know just you know take apart surgery into so many small parts. And thinking of, thinking of surgery, you know, from a physics perspective, is so instructive in terms of what you can do and what you can't do, and how you can bend the limits. And I think. You know, uh, hopefully understanding, you know, uh, the limits of anatomy, the instrumentation, fluidics, machine technologies, all really critical to be able to perform surgery effectively and well. These are some pictures I just brought, brought in from Havo. Uh, and uh, I don't know, Havo, if you want to make a comment on this, but, you know, Havo and I are both finished, finished a book on, on on surgery. And one of the things we talked about was was positions. So I don't know, Havo, do you want to make a couple of comments on, on the different hand positions and hand grips and and, yeah, uh, sure, and great. differentiating them. So um, think about how you hold your instrument and what motions each hand grip that you can hold each specific instrument in is going to um, facilitate and which motions it's going to make harder. So depending on how you grab an instrument, uh, certain motions, if you look at my hand on the video, if you can see me, this is a very natural motion for this specific hand grip. But for example, this is not a very natural motion. So if you're trying to, for example, go down into the eye, this is probably not the best hand grip. But if you change the position of your hand, then you're going to facilitate other motions. For example, this cigar hand grip has a very good uh, wrist rotation motion. And, and if, you keep, if you keep changing your hand grips, and we, we like to call them the pencil grip, the cigar grip, the overhand grip. Uh, there's also the, there's the overhand grip, for example, then there's the underhand grip. And ultimately, the name doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is what specific motions is this specific hand grip going to facilitate inside the eye. And you can also use them to prevent motions that you don't want to have inside the eye. Also using your hands to um, control your um, motions by, by resting them on the forehead or on the cheekbone of the patient. So basically, what I like to think about is before I go into the eye, I look at my instrument on top of the eye, and then I think, what is the best hand position for the direction and for the movement that I'm trying to achieve? Yeah, thanks so much, Alva. You've done so much on this. And, and Gustavo, you know, I, I didn't really plan on putting this grip here, but I'm sure this is your routine grip for everything you do. The, the Gustavo uh, you grip. <laughs> Cigar grip. <laughs> Which actually is my favorite grip, actually. And, and actually, when you look at, you, you look at two, different, two different surgeons here, and they both can do surgery pretty well. Uh, you can probably already imagine which one's more comfortable to hold. I mean, you can look at the one on the left. I mean, all the four fingers are putting pressure on that on that piece. You're kind of in midair there. You're not supporting your hand with the patient's forehead. And the angulation of way, the way the probe is going into the eye is fairly steep, probably causing more wound gape. On the on the right side, you see, which is kind of kind of we're going to re relabel kind of the Gustavo Hooning grip, the cigar grip, so to speak, in some ways. Um, where it's a lot more comfortable, in my opinion. You can see, and you can see how flat the handpiece is in that incision, and it really minimizes the torquing and pushing of the eye. It minimizes the uh, gaping of the incision, and so it's something to think about. And it's particularly important when we're dealing with, you know, micro instruments and complicated maneuvers. Uh, you know, I, I probably in the VR world, Jordy, you, you probably have fairly standardized grips. I'm going to imagine. I don't know if there's much difference. In how you well, there, there is, one. there is significant difference because the anterior segment world is effectively a two plane surgery. It's of course, it's not because you're in a volume, uh, space, but the volume space is the depth of the anterior chamber. So basically is the, the dome of the cornea to the uh, posterior capsule. So when you're doing vitrectomy surgery, your angle is much steeper. And therefore, you have a lot more rotation along your, your, your wrist. Uh, and so you have to be able to sometimes do this one to go to the top and this one to go to the bottom. So you end up having more of this sort of sometimes this, this sort of, uh, I don't know how to call it the, the term, but, but certainly you begin with this concept, but you have to be able to have more degrees of freedom on your wrist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think the wrist action is really, really critical to make sure we have the right depth when you're working in the Z axis, of course, for 
for VR as well. So, you know, th this is just showing kind of some of the grips you can see if you pay attention to the hand position. I, I, I personally like to hold things very flat in the incision. Uh, cigar overhand grips a lot. Uh, I like having, um, you know, two hands of my instruments uh, as we work. So just something to think about as we move along with things. So let's just let's just move to the capsular rexus. I mean, these are just little things I'm just going to add here. I mean, I I, I really like using a, a Utrata instrument with some sharp tips to kind of incise the capsule. I, I typically just make a straight little cut in the center, uh, open the forceps and grab one side of the lip and basically pull to one direction. Uh, I just by habit do a clockwise. I think there's no real reason why you can choose one or the other. And as they often teach you, of course, you know, we're basically following the, uh, the, the circumference of the forceps. If you can see how the forceps is, are basically following a circular pattern, the rexus tends to follow that. And of course, using the right vectors, uh, we're basically able to adjust the, uh, the positioning of this rexus. And it does help to, again, think about the size. And sometimes if we don't look, only look at the pupil size, we may get misled that the pupil or the eye is a smaller or larger eye. So, you know, just right instrumentation helps, visualization helps. Just again, differentiate between shearing and stretching. I think people often get confused with these terms. I think we all know shearing. Uh, stretching basically is when we essentially, you know, pull apart uh, tissue. Uh, it can certainly cause more abrupt changes in the way that the tear is occurring, uh, but it's not as controlled. So we don't typically use this for uh, routine uh, capsular exits, but it can be handy to save things. And this is an example where probably the worst place to run out is subincisionally. And the, the classical answer, of course, when you see it run out is to stop and to inject more viscoelastic. Well, by the time you do that, the rexus may be running out already. So using that little maneuver or that stretch maneuver here can immediately get us back into, into the right position. And, and I know this is probably pretty quick and maybe many people would want to stop and reassess, but often you don't have time. And if you can simply just unfold the flap as you're seeing here, unfold it. And I just want to pause here because when you unfold it, sorry, when, when, you, when you unfold it, uh, you want to make sure that when you grab the, the flap again, the idea is to pull about 90 degrees to the direction you're going. So, for example, if um, if I can annotate, uh, no, I guess I couldn't annotate. Oh, here I can. Okay, so suppose I want I want that rexus to run this way. Let's suppose. Then we want to tear it. We want to pull about 90 degrees to that direction. So not necessarily back to the center. We want to pull about 90 degrees, and this will basically typically lead us to the right way. So that's basically what we do. We want to try to grab the uh, the unfolded flap approximately. I say a couple of millimeters from the uh, from the apex of the tear, and that should give us enough control to do that. And you can see when I play the video again here, uh, the uh, the video play. Sorry, you can see how the direction we're pulling in, about 90 degrees to the way we want to tear, and boom, you get it. You got to be pretty definitive. And I must say, those that are still learning this technique, if you're too scared and too uh, meek about it, it's going to run out. You got to really grab that thing and just you know pull 90 degrees to that to that uh, direction. Otherwise uh, you lose it and it ends up running farther out. I don't know, have any, any thoughts on that? While you do that, I'm just gonna just show another case where not only is this helpful for root for, for, for run it run outs, but when we're doing a pediatric eye, for example, and the Rex is running out, you'll see it starting to run out toward the end. It, it's very helpful to control that um, and ensure we get it back in position here. How about what, any thoughts about, you know, using stretching and shearing? I mean, I know we only reserve it often for when it runs out, but those that are really efficient can actually employ it during a regular rexus formation as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, the the little maneuver, uh, it's called little, um, it's a Brian Little who, who named it. Um, it's something that's always in the back of my mind. So I, I definitely try to do shearing technique, capsular rexus, but the, the capacity to immediately change my vector and turn into a uh, stretching to recover uh, is always in the back of my mind. And, and it really is a great way to recover. Or, you know, and you don't even need to use it when the rexus is, is completely running out. Sometimes I even use it to just change the vector of my capsular rectus if I know that I'm already going too wide. Uh, and, and that is really good at changing the direction of, of your uh, circular um, edge. Agreed, agreed. So I think I think it's just worthwhile to know. So just a quick comment on rexus and, and on uh, and on these things. Let me just let me just share again here. I heard my, my screen's a bit blurry. I don't know. I hope the video is playing OK for you. Um, I'm just going to move. I'm gonna, what I'm going to move on to next is the hydro. Now, I'm going to tell you the hydro dissection is probably the one part, other than the incision, which is the least uh, important step to most people. Uh, I'm sure you agree, Havo, though. Uh, to me, at least, I think that's one of the most important steps in, in doing uh, good, uh, safe FACO. 
Absolutely. Uh, and, and I think it's overlooked often, you know? Um, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, and so I wanted to make a couple of points. And again, I apologize if I'm making basic steps here, but I hope there's some small pros on this because uh, maybe we do things a little different than maybe what, what, what others do here. And there's more than one way to do it, by the way. This is not the only way to do it. But remember this hydrodissection and delineation. I mean, I think we all know the differences. There's a concept of cortical cleaving, which I'll show which if you can master that can certainly make uh, cortical removal perhaps more efficient. And delineation for me is really great for soft lenses. And this just kind of just shows, you know, the, the differences in the anatomy. I hope you, you, you remember the more, the denser, more central epinucleus and the, epi, the endonucleus, sorry, epinucleus. And typically when we're doing hydrodissection, we're separating the endo from epinucleus. And by placing a cannula, you know, into the, into the uh, middle of the lens, into the mid periphery of the lens, we can find that plane. When we, when we find that plane, we typically see the golden ring sign, or this is a double or triple golden ring sign. And it just kind of nicely shows the lamellar dissection. And, and for me, soft lenses were often a challenge until I, until I really mastered hydrolineation, which I think made things uh, certainly a lot slicker. Um, there are obviously benefits in doing both approaches. I don't think we need to do this delineation for denser cataracts, but certainly for softer ones, I, I like to disassemble the endonucleus first. It avoids that whole phenomena of where, you know, we are where we we are trying to restrack the piece and it's like rubber and it's not pulling out of the fornix because it's being held by that thicker rubbery epinucleus. Uh, most of you use a modification of a 27 gauge hydrosection cannula. I, I love the Chan cannula. I think it's one thing that facilitates the maneuvers of hydro as well as rotation of the lens. This is an example post uh, capsule erection. You can see with the cannula placed under the anterior capsule, lifting up. And then I like to sweep. I think the sweeping motion really kind of lifts up the capsule with some gentle irrigation here. And so we've done an anterior hydro here. I flip it around now, subincisionally, and go around to the other side. And again, we're lifting as we're injecting slightly. And then I want to make sure I get, of course, a good posterior wave. And here now we inject, and here we're going to see a separation. Uh, of the capsule from the cortex. And the way you know you did a good hard delineation is you can actually see some of the speckled appearance of the cortex, as opposed to simply just seeing a, 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 a fairly fogged up view. And here we're hard delineating, there's the golden ring. Placing that cannula about 45 degrees into the mid peripheral lens substance is where you go. Very, very important for posterior polar cataracts, in my opinion. Uh, I'll show another video here. And so, you know, this is basically how we do cortical cleaving. Here's the advantage of doing cortical cleaving. You can see that uh, the cannula is lifting up on the capsule, irrigating slightly. Be careful not to do too much irrigation. Uh, I like to make sure I get the whole anterior cortex lifted first, as you can see here, manually and with hydro. So the manual approach is certainly, certainly useful. And then you'll see the posterior wave as we inject it. There's the wave coming. You can see it emerging. And there we go. And there's a hydro delineation. Uh, once, once, we have, once we have this done, you, you'll basically see how efficient the soft lens removal will be because I can simply just uh, pick up the, uh, the endonucleus. And, uh, and yes, that is Sophie in the background. I, I'm sorry, she's not here yet. And uh, the endonucleus is gone like that. There you go. And there's the epinucleus and there's the cortex. So you can see how nice, if you can master cortical cleaving, how basically you have a nice clean capsule. Now, the one caveat, however, is, and one reason why I don't like it is, I don't know how if you do this routinely or not. What you end up getting, though, is some small, diaphanous, scraggly little cortical fibers, which you have to kind of go after and grab. And some yeah, people argue, right. you know what? It's just easier to go after the cortex as, when, it's, when it's there and everything comes out together. What do you think, Havo? I totally agree. I call them the annoying little threads that are left behind. They're like tiny little super thin hairs. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I think, I think those don't matter as much as the beauty and the facility of taking out a lens so easily, especially when they're soft. And I also think that we have such good scopes now that we see a lot more than we used to. Um, and I really don't know how much these tiny little remnant hairs are going to affect our PCO down the road. Uh, I love the Chang, like, like, like you mentioned, um, because with a very slight change in twisting in, in your fingers, you can get those angulation changes to go from parallel to the capsule uh, and, then, and then change that angle to get deep into the uh, cortex or epinucleus to get your nice hydro delineation ring, the golden ring, right? Now, I feel like how you, you, you did uh, in one of your videos, you had multiple rings and, and I like that as well because one of those, if you do multiple, one of those will eventually cleave completely and that's when you can take out that entire uh, nucleus 
whether you do through a hemi slip or sometimes even need to when they're very soft and the central nucleus is very small, you can just take out that tiny little M&M all in one go. And then you're left with a shell that's very easy to extract if you did a good hydro dissection, which is also key. Good hydro dissection, good hydro delineation, very easy. But if you do a bad hydro dissection and then hydro delineate, you're gonna have you're gonna struggle removing that epi nucleus as well. Gustavo, your, your thoughts on on these steps? Actually, I I wanted to add something that you said it was too basic. This kind of stuff, even experienced surgeons are always recycling themselves. I recommend to everyone a book from Georg Eisner, who is an, uh, an ophthalmologist from Switzerland who has already passed away. And he talks about the physics of the surgery. In my humble opinion, it is a must for every resident fellow or surgeon, because in that book, it gives you a clear mind of vectors, forces, fluidics. I'll write in the chat the name of the book and the author so everyone can look it. And the best thing, it is for free download in internet. Yeah, please do, Gustavo. I think uh, that would be very, very helpful. And, you know, Barry Seibel's book on phacodynamics, uh, a, a oldie, oldie classic, um, is, is also very, very helpful to understand these concepts. So agree. So, okay, let's move on from hydro steps. Um, this is a, a pediatric cataract. Just again, just to show how the value of doing um, a nice hydro here. And I think hydro really is helpful and important for softer lenses, soft to moderate lenses. Again, You've seen the technique already. I just, as, as Havo said, and I didn't mention it earlier, but he's absolutely right. The ability to rotate and rotate the Chang because it's basically a you know a uniplanar instrument uh, and maneuver without opening up the, the incision, I think, is really really a value. Uh, this is a pediatric cataract, so you can see you know everything comes out nicely. And I just want to show one other thing that I will do, and I will add a little pearl here is basically capsule polishing. It's something that uh, we often debate on, and I think for adult cases, you can maybe argue whether it's necessary or not, but I do feel for pediatric cases, pseudofoliation eyes um, particularly as well, I think uh, reducing the incidence of anterior capsule contracture is a benefit, and maybe this may perhaps reduce some of the zonular retention that occurs during that process, but certainly in pediatric guys, I think it's an advantage, and you can see I'm using the Singer Sweeper, it's called. Uh, you can use a curette. And you can see just how much of that lens epithelial, epithelial cells is removed. And I try to get to the fornix, of course. That's where you like to be at, but it's hard to visualize that. Um, but the nice thing about this is you can go through a side port. You can get the subincisional cortex out easily and nicely. And you can just see just how much, how much of it just comes out off that anterior capsule. And so it is something that uh, I think is a handy instrument to have. Uh, and it, I do find it is something that uh, can be used in these situations here. Just, just to kind of finish off with, posterior, with the, posterior, with the uh, posterior capsule, this is my preference here. You can see I've actually put the eye well in already. And of course, we know we have to manage the posterior capsule in pediatric eyes. Uh, I've been doing this now for a long time and basically is simply doing a posterior capsule rexus. No vitrectomy. I'm interested in Jordi and, and Gustavo's and Havo's perspective on this one, but uh, no vitrectomy uh, and, uh, and then doing a posterior rexus. In fact, I remember Jordi, we did talk about it at one of the webinars before, but you can see we're basically using, in this case, a 27 gauge needle bevel down in going through the posterior capsule, injecting uh, some dispersive viscoelastic. And there you see that opening you see there. And really a posterior rexus, as I often tell people, is very much like doing an anterior rexus, except it's very thin, so it's harder to control. And the number one pearl I tell people is just grab frequently, grab frequently, keep on re-grabbing, using a micro instrument so we don't have to open up the incision, using stretching, using shearing, and making sure the rexus is not going to be too large. So I typically will even go a little bit under five millimeters to make sure I can do a good optic capture, which is what we want to do here. And uh, again, more viscoelastic to inject in burger space. Jordi, Jordi loves vitreous. Gustavo loves vitreous. I don't. Uh, and so I'm keeping things uh, separated here. And I'm going to leave that alone. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go and evacuate the viscoelastic after I do this. I'm going to leave it there. And the pressure, yes, may elevate, although kids handle that pretty well. Um, but I'd rather not have to engage vitreous here. So if I'm really worried, I can put them on, uh, on an oral zolomide elixir formulation if I have to. And there the haptics are in the bag, and we're going to prolapse the optic through that posterior capsule. I love this technique. It keeps the lens epithelial cells away from the anterior hyloid, and I think it can really do well to uh, protect from secondary visual access pacification. Um, and so for me, at least, I'm typically putting this in two years and above. Uh, when I do that, this is exactly what I do. I don't know, Jordi and, and Gustavo, do you have any comments on that? 
I, I got to say a couple of things. First of all, I love this technique. Um, I do have a lot of, I do a lot of attracting young kids and um, particularly on pseudophagic babies, sometimes even less than six months of age. And that there goes the discussion about when to put lenses or not. But, but I do want to make a broader perspective. And by the way, on the topics of the basics of surgery, this is a side note. You know, when we practice martial arts, I've learned that when you say we're practicing basics, people get bored. But when you say we're practicing fundamentals, people think it's serious so i would say we're practicing fundamentals of surgery so anyway so it, going back to children there's there's this perception perhaps on the pediatric uh, uh ophthalmology world that there's some form of anterior vitreous fibrosis that occurs and th that is simply just not true the what simply happens in these patients that that have uh is proliferation of the lens epithelial cells and you have you know, yeah. notice you're trying to clean up the, the periphery and the, um, you know, the fornix, but they have a, a remnant of, of epithelial cells, so lens epithelial cells that will grow on whatever substrate you give them. So there's nothing special about that. So I've had to, um, you know, multiple children that I've had to operate do vitrectomies probably four or five times between the age of two months and the age of two years, cleaning up lens epithelial cells that are covering the visual axis. Uh, so your technique, what you're doing over here is exactly correct. It's really not about the vitreous. There's nothing special about the hyloid that makes it contract or, or fibrose. It's just simply where the lens are going to grow. You know, it's just that simple. Agreed. Agreed. Gustavo, any, any comments on you and, or, or, or Havo as well? This is, yes, this is yes. by the way, the stinger sweeper, just so you, just so you can see it. Uh-huh. So okay, well that's good. Let 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 me move on here. Yeah, I want to so make sure just, we just... I, I just I just yeah, want to add ahead, something in, in, in case in case someone still is, is still wondering why the the double optic capture or the posterior optic capture technique. Um, so, like Gustavo said, the opacification is due to proliferation of lens epithelial cells onto the anterior hyaloid, and if you posterior optic capture your IOL optic, the the cells can't go there. They can't get there because you're blocking them with your optic. So that's the whole rationale between doing that or a vitrectomy if you're going to leave the lens in the bag and just do a PCCC. Okay, let, let me move to, uh, to uh, a, a very, just a very routine case. I just want to just walk everybody through this. First of all, my first comment is, Pavo, tell me about incisions. Tell me why people, and I, we, we train residents, man, this is usually the thing that people pay the least attention to. And yet that's the door that opens us into doing beautiful surgery. But yet it seems like it just kind of gets, you know, lost in the whole, in the whole uh, process. Any comments about what you want to say about incisions and what they, how we should think about them? Yeah. So the, you already said it, it's, it's the door into the eye. So make sure that you open a door onto the room that you want to enter basically. And incisions, uh, you need to think about the clock hours in terms of where you want to place them. So are you going to place it? at surgeon six, surgeon three, surgeon nine, whatever. Uh, and you also need to think about the direction of your incision, right? So the incision is going to basically define the trajectory of your instrument inside the eye. So you need to make sure that your incisions are pointing towards the structure that you're trying to reach and are in the correct configuration so that you will be able to fit whatever instrument it is you're trying to fit in. So this, you can see the direction of this, of this incision that's being made. And, and in order to do that, the incision has to be a certain length. Uh, if the incision is very short, then you know that basically that you're typically pointing down closer to the iris. And so uh, I often see this a lot of times with people when they make such a short side port, this leaks at the end of the case as well. And, the, and then the instruments are not being used in the, in the incision appropriately. They're basically torquing the incision because the incision is going one way and instruments going the other way. So yeah, pay attention to that. I, I'm one who likes to make a more limbal incision. I think having a little bit of, uh, of blood, I think is helpful to help with that fiber and seal early on. If you're doing MIG surgery, it can get in the way, however, and make it the right size. Of course, I, I like using a soft shell. This is again, I'm just gonna walk through my, my, my approach here. Soft shell, we got a dispersive under the cornea, half filled the AC. Then the bottom half is with the cohesive. It kind of creates space and pushes up the, the dispersive against the cornea. Uh, I, I do like to not grab the eye. You see, I'm basically using a closed forceps at the nasal limbal area, a pair of uh, Colibri forceps for counter-traction. I see a lot of people grab the eye here. They grab the eye here nasally, and they make an incision here. And of course, when you grab the eye, just the laws of physics. So suppose you're grabbing the eye here with a pair of forceps, your incision. 
and you're and you're basically now entering the eye this way. Well, what's going to be the net vector force? You're going to end up torquing the eye this way, right? Around this fulcrum. So, you know, I, I don't think it's ergonomic to grab the eye anywhere but anywhere but 180 degrees away from the decision you're making. At least on a physics level, I think that is the most appropriate way to do it. So I go right across the eye and do that. You'll see the eye will not torque. The eye will stay positioned for me. I'm not grabbing the eye. I don't want to cause subconscious hemorrhage. And I basically make a uniplanar entry. Again, I, I my pet peeve again is for is for when when, I, when people make anterior incisions in the cornea. This happens with femto sometimes. There's really no benefit from that other than perhaps causing more endothelial cell loss, causing more surgical, surgically induced astigmatism, and perhaps you know not getting that fiber and seal as fast as you can. So think about going limbus. Of course, don't go too far back. Otherwise, you end up getting you know chemosis. But find that right limbal area to go. That's my preference. Again, I'm just I'm just spewing out my my own ideas, which not are and all was right. Uh, a little. This is about cataract tidbits, and there you go. So we're basically this is 2.2 millimeter incision. I've already showed about. I've already showed the rexus. So I'm going to pass on that. Uh, I'm going to pass on the hydro. This is a moderately dense central nuclear opacity, opalescent opacity, and you can see I'm 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 not just going in with my hydro dissection cannula injecting. And I'm done. You watch. I spend maybe about 10 seconds here. To go and in, you know, in this case, I'm going around. I'm spreading around. I'm roughening up the cortex. I'm moving to the other quadrant, and basically, I'm going all the way around here because I want to make sure I loosen up all that cortex. I'm not just going in and just injecting. I think to me, to me, this really facilitates the cortical removal. And the time I spend now, which is an extra maybe seven eight seconds, and many of you do, I think I save it on my cortical removal. Um, this is this is basically my current approach. Okay, so 100. percent Can I add something quickly? Not just yes, go ahead, cortical removal, like. Not just the cortical removal, but also your nuclear disassembly, because you'll be able to rotate that nucleus freely. And that is a great pearl that I learned from you guys, from you and from Diamond Tam. Um, and, and yes, it's that extra few seconds that you spend hydro dissecting instead of just sending one quick little wave and moving on to the next step. Seiko is really about, like Jordi said, fundamentals. It's like a building. You have good foundation. The next steps are going to be easier and easier. So a good rex is, of course, well, incisions to start off with. That's a, that's key, and then your then your rex is, is the next foundation. And hydro dissection to me is one of the main foundations of easy surgery. So come on, yes, uh, I, I think those are absolutely absolutely they're building blocks to the next step. So so I'm just going to show you my classic approach. And what I like to do is I I, I mean as we know this vertical and horizontal chopping right, you know very simple. Don't forget horizontal chopping. We're going out to the equator. We're not typically relying on lollipopping. We're simply using the, the phaco tip as kind of a chopping block. And then coming toward the 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 the, uh, the phaco tip, as opposed to vertical chop, uh, we're basically coming down like a like a chisel coming down on the lens substance to basically crack it. In this case, we need to have very good we need to have very good uh, purchase of the lens. Otherwise, of course, the lens falls back. So just remember that. And I'm, what I'm going to show you basically is uh, Sophie is uh, <laughs> is uh, don't call don't call don't call children's aid on me here. Um, you can see I'm going to basically use a kind of modification. I'm going to do a vertical chopping here. You can see I'm going to go right down into the lens substance, but I also have a vertical motion, horizontal motion too. And so this is very effective for dealing with moderately to dense lenses. And I want I want you to show a couple of things here. First of all, you can see I'm placing my chopper maybe about uh, you know two three millimeters from the where I'm entering the phaco tip. The phaco tip is not entering at the at the central part of the lens. It's entering more proximal and ending up in the center. Not starting center and entering, entering up in the periphery. Uh, second point here, the chopper is going to go down to its full depth of its, of its tip, straight down. And then we're going to basically move to the left with my left hand, right with my right hand. Now watch the crack here. The crack, of course, is not full propagated. And the more we laterally separate, the more we cause tension on the zonule. So don't forget you can do what, 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 I, what technically we call a back crack. Um, politically incorrect, we call it spread the legs. And you can see what I mean by this. We're basically spreading the heminuclei back there. So you can do sequential cracking, which is very effective to do this. This is a hemi flip. I flip up the hemi section and basically just engulf it, uh, ideally using torsional. This is not a torsional case here. Um, and, and this is a, just a simple way to do a hemi nuclear uh, hemi flip. Same thing here again. Uh, you know, it's nice to have the phaco tip uh, parallel or you know, to a butt the uh, shelf that we formed with the crack. And again, because we have nice hard delineation, we have the nice and the nucleus coming to us and use the chopper to help to carousel the piece. Look at the chopper pushing the piece off here so we don't go through it. We want to carousel it. 
Epinuclear removal sometimes can be a challenge for folks. Turn off the phacal and simply aspirate in a circular motion and flip it. If not, use your IA to do that. And that can really uh, facilitate that, uh, that, that aspect of, um, of, the, of the epinuclear removal. Uh, let's just basically then uh, go to cortical removal. And uh, essentially, you know, I like using a straight tip, which is very unpopular. But uh, as Hava kind of mentioned with the Chang cannula, when you have a straight tip, you can maneuver in three dimension with minimal torquing and minimal uh, gaping of the incision, uh, as opposed to a curved tip or an angle tip where you have to think about the tip again, torquing and rotating uh, potentially and, uh, and, and, and gaping that incision or grabbing something you don't want to grab. Polishing is nice to do as well. As you see here, we're using a, a low vac, low setting here. And the polymer tip perhaps adds some benefit. And I'm often, I'm, I often like to, before coming out of the eye, keep the chamber formed. I don't know what Jordi and, and Gustavo feel, but I'm pretty sure in some eyes, when we collapse the anterior segment, and that vitreous base is kind of moving forward like that, it might not be a good thing for higher risk eyes. So keeping the eye pressurized at all times by coming out of the eye, by injecting to the side port, I don't know. I just feel better about it. I don't know if I can prove it or not, Jordy. What do you think? I agree. I agree with you. And I'm going to be talking later about how hypotony can cause real problems. Perfect. That that fits in perfectly with, with what I think I've tried to accomplish, Gustavo. And I, I would yeah. add for people who are starting to perform surgery about you said here from the whole perspective. First of all, when you are doing rexes, do not push the lower lip, or you're going to have OVD coming out of the eye, and you're going to lose pressure. And the second thing. When you're going to do a vertical chop, watch out with that tip or you're going to have some posterior capsule ruptures. I had a lot when I was learning to use them. So change the chopper if you need it, okay? It's not wrong to, you, to have more than one chopper with you. Actually, it's the best thing to, to do. Thank you for mentioning that, Gustavo. You're absolutely right. And, and what I showed you was a vertical chopper. It's shorter than a typical Nagahara horizontal chopper, which you cannot really do good vertical chopping with. Uh, the, 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 the chopper here, you can see just a little bit of an example of what it looks like here, sort of. Um, and this, you can kind of have some facility to do both. Although really, if you want to do horizontal chopping, the best thing to do would be using more of a blunt tip. I, I rarely go out to the capsule anyways. I typically do something that's more of a hybrid, but absolutely, absolutely valid point. And thank you for mentioning that. Um, just a comment about, about, uh, about cortical removal. Now th this is for you, Jordi. Okay. There are two, there's two, there's two schools of camps. Okay. There's strippers and there's suckers. I don't know what you are, but strippers are basically old school, right? Basically grabbing the cortex. <laughs> I wasn't the one with the cigar now. Come on. <laughs> I know. And, but literally, literally, I mean, strippers are basically, you grab the cortex, they bring it to the center. This is basically how the older style, you know, Simcoe needles were done where they basically cortex was grabbed, brought to the center and aspirated. In my humble opinion, I think we can now use the benefit of advanced fluidics to use aspiration techniques, meaning sucking. But we're not so much stri stripping, we're using the aspiration flow and vacuum to literally basically remove the cortex rather than having to strip it off the capsular bag. Now, of course, we end up doing a bit of both, but it's something just to keep in mind and consider. The other thing to keep in mind and think about, again, is thinking about maybe that we think about removing the submissional cortex first because this provides a bit of a benefit in perhaps having some protection from the posterior capsule by the residual remaining capsule there, rather than removing everything and leaving the sub incisional to the end. Just my own thoughts. Uh, I will also make a big uh, push for, for linear control of fluidics. Um, we debate this. I'm sure the VR guys debate this as well and what they do, but I love, love, love having linear control of my foot pedal from 0 to 60 and 0 to 700 for vacuum and aspiration during, during um, cortical removal because it gives me so much control as I'm going up and down my foot pedal. There's so much, you know, it's like an orchestra. You're kind of, you know, pushing down and let, letting go as, as you need to. And so I think it really provides control. Um, and you see basically the settings that we have here. And so this is just some examples of cortical removal. You can see we're going to go after the sub first. And again, we're, rather than stripping to the center, a little bit there, but we're basically using the aspiration here from our phaco, from our IA to grab it, right? And staying near the rex's edge, we need to go back and forth a little bit to tease it, yes? So there's not completely, we can't avoid strippers completely, they're never going to go away. But we are basically trying to use aspiration here to, uh, to maximize the efficiency here and minimize movement. Capsules break during IA when capsule is grabbed and moved. Not when capsule is grabbed alone, typically, unless you really floor it and, and don't, don't let go. Uh, but if you if you grab capsule and move, that's when capsules break. 
And so, and so that's basically the, uh, you know, uh, for me, at least a little bit of a tip in, in cortical removal. I, I, Havo and Gustavo, no, I want to give you a chance to maybe make any comments if you wish, just about this. Yeah, so make a comment again I, about power. This is power washing, by the way. Yeah, that's 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 a great one too. I, I really I learned that from you as well. I really love the power washing to get rid of all those uh, LECs that are that are left there. Sometimes those those annoying little threads that we were talking about, when you can't aspirate them, power washing will always get rid of them. Uh, but back to uh, um, cortical uh, aspiration. Um, I like to think of it as a tangential aspiration instead of a, a centripetal. Um, and there's actually some interesting Miyake views where uh, the, the, the stripping technique causes more zonular stress than a tangential uh, vacuum only and not pulling from the periphery towards the center, but rather going sort of around the periphery uh, using your vacuum to strip the cortex tangentially at an oblique angle rather than periphery to center of the eye. So you're also causing less, uh, less uh, zonular stress that way. I think that I think that's that's a, that's I think it's a valid point with zonular weakness. We try to avoid stripping directly away from the zonular area, and that's a that's a benefit of doing it this way as well. Agreed. Great. So, um, you know, I want to share those little tidbits. There's a lot of things to talk about with Faco. Uh, I appreciate um, the uh, the comments we've got from uh, from Havo and Gustavo and Jordi. Um, depending on on what more we can talk about, there's a lot more we can do, but. I know you're here to talk about and hear about FACO disasters, right? Everybody wants to hear about disasters, Jordy, uh, and hear about what, uh, what, what bad things are going to happen, how you're going to save the world. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it over to Jordy. Jordy, you probably know about the optimized screen share if you're doing any videos, so, um, if you wish. Uh, we're we're good. Sorry. We're good. So you got this. Okay, buddy, listen, thanks again for being here, Jordy. We're, 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 uh, the, the floor is yours. Gustavo, you're, uh, you're here with us as well in Havo, so... We'll jump right into it. Thank you. And please, by all means, interrupt me as I'm going. As I said, thank you again for this opportunity. And, and thank you. Um, nice to meet you, Chavo and Gustavo. We, we met at our Harvard leadership course, uh, surgical leadership course last year. And uh, it's been a great opportunity to work with him and the other uh, ophthalmologists in that team. Uh, my financial disclosures, I wish it were as long as Ike. I just started my own practice and started again from scratch. So I'm working with Genentech, Regeneron, and Boston Law mostly. Uh, and I was asked to give some goals for the presentation. I want to say that we're going to be talking about the problems that can lead to severe permanent vision loss after cataract surgery and how to avoid those. So when you think about, from my perspective, as a, cat, as a retinal surgeon receiving the problems that the cataract surgeons have, so what, what are the different problems that we can talk about? We can talk about drop nucleus, dislocations of intractor lenses, tears, detachments, cystic, cystic macular edema, Certainly vascular retinopathies that may get worse or macular edema from them, say like diabetic retinopathy or vein occlusions uh, and all these other issues, you know, endophthalmitis, for example. But, but you know, endophthalmitis can be really bad, but that's for a separate lecture. I, I want to talk about the things that are surgical dependent that we can control. Because endophthalmitis, we really cannot control with our surgical techniques other than aseptic techniques, you know. So what I want to talk about is what are the things that can make a patient go blind. So when I mean disasters, I don't mean, oh my gosh, uh, you call it the refractive uh, surprises when the patient's just, you know, a few doctors away from, from emetropia. That's not what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking, how can a patient go blind after cataract surgery? That's what I consider a disaster. And what are those? Basically these three groups. Number one, glaucomas. Of course, by definition, and I can talk about how glaucoma can make a patient go blind, but oftentimes what happens in these patients, it's not just glaucoma pro progression, but intraocular pressure leading to a vein occlusion and loss of vision permanently from that. Needless to say, tears that effectively lead to retinal detachments. And we were mentioning about hypotony and how the other big one here is supracortical hemorrhages. And these are, in my perspective, the three big groups of things that can go really bad that are surgical dependent. So let's talk about lens-induced glaucoma. And by the way, I feel free to join because you know more about glaucoma than I do. Um, but, but the point here about lens-induced glaucoma is that it really depends on the hardness of the retained lens material. And we're, we're assuming at this point that the surgery, that the cataract surgery had lens fragments left inside of the eye. You know, And so these lens fragments cause effects and problems. And these are basically, for the most part, inflammation and intraocular pressure. Macrophages and inflammatory cells need to access these proteins. And that means that oftentimes people are so worried about these super hard nuclei 
And in my experience, these hard nuclei barely have much inflammatory reaction because it's like a pebble inside the eye versus these kind of a moderately hard epinucleus, uh, they can have a significant inflammatory reaction and can basically go into the trabecular meshwork and increase, uh, cause less induced glaucoma. Let me find it here. So, because effectively there's two types of glaucoma that, that cause, that are caused by this. It's lens particle, when you have pieces of lens that physically block the meshwork. And again, as I said, Ike, this is your world. Uh, and the other one is the inflammatory reaction to these to these uh, lens fragments, so fake antigenic glaucoma. And most of the times, you know, if, if the anterior segment surgeon just left a little piece in the anterior, in the anterior segment, you guys will come and fix it, it's no problem. The real issue is when there's a drop nucleus. And, and I guess the point I'm trying to make here is I'm starting to discuss what or how bad truly is a dropped nucleus in, in, in our world. Um, for here, I have a case example. Uh, and this, these are patients that I've seen. Case example, unmanaged nucleus fragment in the vitreous. Uh, the surgeon noticed a posterior capsular rupture, uh, attempted to perform vitrectomy, but there's a new nucleus fragment that went down into the, into the vitreous that he didn't see. Uh, and that implied didn't recognize it during surgery and didn't recognize it after surgery, you know? Oftentimes the cataract surgeons don't necessarily do a full dilation uh, and look at the periphery. Uh, and so this patient had a piece of nucleus in the back. Patient comes back a month later with intraocular pressure of 65 and an ischemic central retinal vein occlusion, which ultimately led to a, pre a vision of hand motions. That's bad. <laughs> and, and the issue here though, is whenever the surgeon, the anterior segment surgeons gets really worried about a drop nucleus, I always want to have you guys pull back a little bit and say, how bad is this truly? I'm not talking about how bad is this going to look on my reputation? Uh, how bad is, you know, the other doctors around here going to talk about me? I'm talking about how bad is it for the patient, him or herself, in, in their visual outcomes? And oftentimes, a drop nucleus, and Gustavo can join in in here, we get so many of these patients that have a wonderful, wonderful final visual outcome uh, result. And it usually comes down to recognition and appropriate management. And I'll, I'll keep on going. Do you have anything on that, Gustavo? Uh, I think you said the perfect word. Most of doctors, most no, but many doctors are, they are ashamed because they had a posterior capsular rupture. They don't want, they don't want to send you the case, but for anterior, anterior segment people, have a good retinal friend, okay? Yeah. It happens. It's like riding a motorcycle. <clears throat> just people riding a motorcycle will gonna fall and just people doing cataracts will have a PCR with nucleus in the vitreous. And the thing is, I'll add a little bit, excuse me, Jordi. Please. Uh, I have two words here when you have a case like this. Stop and think. These are the two words you, you need. If you have some dropped nucleus or fragment, stop, don't, Try to get it out because you're going to have a retinal tear. Probably George is going to talk about it. Yeah. And close it and send to the retina guy because this is very common. Where, like I'm referenced uh, like Jordi here. We have many cases like this. And as soon as you see, as you send the patient for the retinal uh, surgeon, better are the, the perspective or the prognosis for these cases. But, but in general terms, the vast majority of these patients have a great outcome. Looking, looking at a final visual outcome, not the process, not do they have to have more surgeries. So I guess what I'm trying to instill is the thought that if something goes bad and back during surgery, don't react thinking that the world is over. On the contrary, what you need to do is recognize and manage appropriately to avoid something like this, which is a true disaster after cataract surgery. So Jordi, I mean, maybe the question that the audience may have would be like, I think if there's a pretty big piece, I think most people are going to be like, I need to get it to retina, right? But what is what are your thoughts about where maybe there's a small fragment that that's there, maybe even see it post-operatively, um, you know, what did that I think, refer? I mean, what are your comments on that issue? So that's a great question, because I think from my perspective, we have never any trouble seeing these patients. And every so often you'll see and manage or, or follow a, a small little uh, fragment there's really not a big issue in terms of going in and cleaning up 
uh, uh, even a small nuclear fragment, because I got to tell you, sometimes they don't have any real inflammation, but they will be complaining forever about floaters. And you don't want to deal with that as well. Uh, but, but the issue here is that if you've done a good cataract surgery, you haven't messed up with the cornea, your lens is in good position, then even a small fragment, we can kind of cool it down and deal with it, uh, you know, sometime later, not necessarily the next day. Uh, and, and you don't have to feel that something as bad has happened uh, just because that occurred. Because and, and, you, and you'd agree though a little bit, a little bit of cortex in the vitreous is, is probably going to be okay. You don't always go yeah. after that. And, and, but most importantly, you can watch it. If it starts giving problems and deal with it, you know, there's, Follow there me. is time. Follow it is not a sudden emergency. It's you know? just another day in the office. That's just it. another day in the office. Exactly. So let's talk about other situations. For example, you were talking about problems with IOL. So I've, I've dealt with this more than you can imagine. When patients get sent to me early after cataract surgery with intraocular lens dislocated into the vitreous cavity, uh, usually this means that the phacal surgeon did not identify or manage the posterior capsular rupture. Um, I've seen a lot of people in Ike, you know, and you'd be surprised how many modern fellows or residents don't know how to put a sulcus implantation because they got so used to putting one piece IOLs in the bag, you know, cause that's what they did during residency. Then they don't know how to put a three piece and fold it or do anything. So I've seen that situation and basically one piece IOLs inject into the bag that immediately dropped into the vitreous. Usually if you notice the problem prior in this one, the number one issue is not identifying the problem or you think that it happened, but you convince yourself that it, that it didn't happen because you just don't want to admit it. So you have to identify and admit that the problem occurred so you can actually deal with it appropriately and avoid a disaster. And, uh, but, but even then, for example, this is a patient sent to me post of day one. You know, uh, I still don't think of this as a horrible disaster. I think that a lot of, a lot of you know, uh, cataract surgeons wouldn't be proud of themselves for this. But I want to tell you, I've seen this happen in the best of hands. So, so I think the bigger issue here is, will this patient have a great outcome? This patient had a 2020 outcome after the fact. So why? Well, let's, let's go back in here and let's talk about what are the things that concern me when I look at this patient? Well, number one, hey, listen, it's a three-piece IOL. We can handle that. Uh, but this is the issue right here. Vitreous in the interior chamber going towards the wound. So management of that vitreous becomes the most important thing to avoid a true disaster. I don't think of the IOL as a disaster. I think about this being a disaster, a retinal detachment after, after a cataract surgery. So let's talk about this example, for example. Uh, this is a patient had posterior capsule rupture, identified by the cataract surgeon, a, a, a anterior vitrectomy was performed. I don't know, if, I think it was translimbal. It was a long operation. An interior chamber and trochlear lens was implanted primarily, vitreous in the interior chamber, and the vitreous was wrapped around the haptics of the interior chamber IOL, moderate corneal edema. The surgeon felt that he had handled it appropriately because the lens was in. By the way, this is one of my pet peeves. You're talking about pet peeves. One of my pet peeves is cataract surgeons believing that the surgery has done well because an intraocular lens is left inside the eye. And, and that's, the IOL is, is just icing on the cake of cataract surgery. That's the way I think about it. This on the other hand is a disaster because now you have to fix a retinal detachment with corneal edema, with vitreous wrapped around an interior chamber and trochlear lens in the front. That's not something good or, or easy to deal with. So again, the point comes down to identifying the problem, managing it appropriately and dealing with it and not making a bigger situation worse, for example. Let's talk about another case example, interoperative retinal tear. Hey, and, one, one question for please. you, Jordy. I mean, we get this sometimes too. Let's say the lens is well-centered. Everything looks great. There's vitreous in the anterior chamber, okay? You know, there's maybe a zonder defect or maybe there's a PC opening and, you know, un, un, uh, it was, it was you know, un, unanticipated. Um, and uh, and it's there, eyes, eyes pretty quiet. There's no traction you can see. Like it's not coming to the incision. It's not really mm -hmm. even attached to the pupil. It's just a blob there. What are your thoughts on leaving that in there? Because you know, you know, of course, we've seen people all the time. This vitreous in the AC at the pupil, and they're, and they're see finally yeah. they're there forever. You know, so at what point do you think we need to kind of address it? What do you think about that? I think I think acutely, you you have to think about you know the bigger issue is the one that you said. If there's vitreous in the interior chamber, where's this vitreous coming from? 
you know, it's a different story when you have one of your crazy cases that you have where there's zonius already lost and you know that you're going to be dealing with vitreous. If you're doing a standard cataract surgery and there's vitreous in the interior chamber at the end, the first question is, where is it coming from? And what do I have to deal with? Because that may also mean that there, your lens may displace. That may mean that there's, there's something else to deal with. But assuming, assuming that the vitreous is not to the wound, that you haven't pulled on it, you can probably leave it. But I think the bigger issue is after the surgery, make sure that the peripheral retina gets evaluated properly and thoroughly and repeatedly because we can avoid a problem. You know, remember that a retinal detachment doesn't just happen. You first have a tear and there's a lapse between one and the other. And so you have a window of dealing with these situations. So if you were to send me Ike a patient that you did cataract surgery a couple of weeks ago and there's a little vitreous in the anterior chamber, I would look at that patient very carefully. And if I see an issue, I can always go back in and clean that up and look at the far periphery and hopefully avoid any real problems. You know? Yeah. So I think the question is how do you deal with it primarily when you're sitting at the table? Yeah, and I, and I and I will say I've had cases where there's a fair amount of vitreous in the anterior chamber and in the angle, and and that can cause elevated pressure. By the way, you know, just vitreous Absolutely. in the anterior chamber in the angle can do that. You clear it out, and they're better. It can certainly cause endothelial trauma. So anytime it's big enough and got touch into the angle, touch into the cornea, even close proximity, I think it's worth, worthwhile. I have to admit, there's some cases where you see a small little vitreous, it's free and mobile, and the retina is stable and fine. We wash the retina. And, you know, and, and they're okay, right? You know, so yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's the balancing act. I, I, the absolutely. The issue here, sorry, Jordi, is to, check if there is, if, is to check if there is traction or not. That's the big question. And like I, like I just said, you have to check the patient because usually it's post-op, you're doing running because you have lots of patients, you have to go again into the OP room. So give the time to check it, the, it deserves. That's very important. Yeah. And it's also very easy to miss the attachment to the, to the wounds. So please feel free to use Trimcinolone to, to actually Absolutely. verify that the vitreous Absolutely. is unattached to something or being pulled. Uh, and you, again, the point here is you have to be objective and clear minded and say, is this really what I'm seeing? Or I'm trying to convince myself that this is all simply good. You know, don't convince yourself because you're not going to, you're, you're going to lose. You just get, have to be honest with the situation. So let's talk yeah, about leave, this. Leave your ego at the door is, is the thing. That exactly. I like. Leave your ego at the door. Yeah. So these, these, these case examples are patients that I've taken care of. So for example, intraperfetal tear, great cataract surgeon, wonderful guy in the operating room. He was doing 30 cases that one day. He had a new nurse that handed him a viscoelastic cannula that had not been properly uh, uh, screwed to the viscoelastic. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, we've he, seen that. He goes to inject it and the cannula just shoots out through the interior lens capsule, posterior lens capsule into the peripheral retina. And uh, he goes, oops. Now, the point I'm making here is that this you would think that would be a disaster. and the point is this guy, all he did, he pulled that capsule, pulled that, put that little cannula, put a suture on the wound, gave me a call. I took that patient to surgery that same afternoon. I did the vitrectomy from the back and sent me from the back, put an anterior chamber. I'm sorry, a sulcus IOL, had a patient with basically 20-20 vision. My point is that even these bad things, if properly handled, can be dealt well. And this is where I'm going to go. So how to avoid these disasters? Going back to the points and the ones that Gustavo was saying, first of all, recognize early the signs of problems, capsule tear, drop mass material. Accept the reality. Do not deny it. Leave your ego at the door. And just as Gustavo said, stop. Wait a minute. Just take, get, regain your com composure and breathe. Oftentimes, everything starts, people start getting worried. You can start seeing fogging on their, on their glasses because they're breathing harder. Their heart rate goes fast. Remember that the patient hears what is happening because most of these patients are not, not asleep. So, so be careful with saying oops or something like that because then you're putting yourself into, into having to explain that situation. If you're not comfortable with the situation, again, stop. Don't make a bad situation worse. Remove the instruments from the eye. Fill the eye with viscoelastic. Air, actually, by the way, I love air because it lets you see a lot of things and it's cheap. Cut any vitreous through the wound you can always use, uh, don't use wax cells, but as people are trying to get your vitrectomy equipment, get your scissors and just cut out the wound. Don't let anything be under there. 
suture the wound, and let me go back to this later, avoid hypotony. Hypotony can be a real problem sometimes. And as Gustavo said, call your best retina surgeon slash psychotherapist. Uh, because listen, I, on a regular basis, I have friends that call me from the operating room table and saying, I got this going on. What should I do? And all they need is just a little, it's okay, man. It'll be okay. Do this, do that. I'll see this patient tomorrow. I'll see this patient this afternoon. And they have great outcomes. The point is avoid going down the surgical rabbit hole. What is this? Complications lead to anxiety. Anxiety leads to bad decisions leads to tremor, then the surgery becomes longer, the pupil comes down, your, your cornea becomes edematous, and this thing in turn leads to more complications and this bad circular you know, situation and you go down the rabbit hole of really, really bad complications. So avoid them, stop, don't make a bad situation worse. If you're not comfortable with the situation, a proper vitrectomy or secondary IOL can be performed, not that same day, but later if necessary with great visual outcomes. Remember that the goal of cataract surgery is final visual rehabilitation, not immediate visual rehabilitation. Of course you want immediate. Of course that's what you told the patient. But at the end of the day, you want the patient to see five years from now, not five days from now. In terms of meiosis and corneal edema, which is a problem, and this is an issue. You prevent visualization of anterior capsular rim. You don't know what's happening. Makes the vitreous and less visualization much harder and also prolongs the surgery. So it's this sort of rabbit hole that I'm talking about. So if you are capable, if you know what you're doing and you're feeling good mentally and physically, you know, do your bimanual anterior vitrectomy, consider the pars plane approach if you know how to do it. Carefully evaluate your options for intraocular lens implantation. There's something you have to be very clear headed what you want to do. As you know, I has taught you guys, if the bag, I, if you can put it in the bag IOL if you have a small tear. Uh, do a posterior capsular rexus if you want to. If you want to do so, the sulcus IOL is adequate if there's a good rim, which is the vast majority of cases when you have a good cataract surgery because you have a proper capsular rexus on the majority. I did, you know, I've I'm a proponent for AC IOL still having a role in the world. Some people don't believe them, but I will agree with everybody. Do not place a, place a primary anterior chamber IOL. To me, that's a marker for disasters. You can always make that decision later. Preferably use a three-piece IOL if you're not sure, because we can work with those and you don't have to explant them and reposition them. Consider capturing the IOL in the capsular rim. This is what you guys have done. Ultimately, I always think about this. This is the rule of holes. It was taught to me by an old surgeon who said, when you're inside a hole, stop digging. And that's how you avoid complications of the serious type. Now let's talk about communication with the patient. This is very important. I strongly believe that you have to be honest with the patient when the problem occurs. Disclose that the problem was encountered during surgery. Explain what was done to manage it in surgery. Tell the patient that you're going to refer him to a retina specialist. Explain that further, further surgery may be required. Also tell them that the visual results may not be compromised if we proceed carefully. And the patient, you know, whether you want it or not, they always almost know that something bad has happened. Whenever these patients get referred to me, they always tell me, you know, I didn't, I was there and uh, I heard these things. They know. Don't, don't try to avoid this. You know, I've been involved in so many of these cases and I can say I have never, not once, had a patient file a lawsuit. Against me, I have zero lawsuits filed by a patient, thank God. But I've seen situations where the patient tries to file a lawsuit against the cataract surgeon. Never, not once, have I seen a patient file a lawsuit against a cataract surgeon that disclosed the complication and worked with me or his retina specialist to fix the problem. Usually is when patients know that something happened and it wasn't properly disclosed. So disclosure is your best bet. Now- That's a great point, Jordi. I just want to add something real quick. Um, I also, from a great teacher, I learned that patients uh, will, or, or, or I, I, let me rephrase that. My, my teacher has said, I have had patients forgive me for anything except for not being there when they needed me. So you need to be them, there for them. If you, if you made a mistake, Okay, and, right. and the only thing that I'd like to add is um, I, for example, in my consent, uh, it is specified that 99.999% of the time, I will not need another surgeon to finish the surgery. But there is a very small percentage of cases where I may need to recur to another specialist to help me finish the job. Absolutely. And that way, they're warned. And if it, if it does happen, you can say, hey, you're that 0.1%, but don't worry. My buddy here is going to take care of the lens that's in the back. Done. 
So from my perspective, when you get these patients sent over to me, let me tell you what makes my work in Gustavo Ford difficult. Number one, vitreous wrapped around haptics. That's bad. And we see that. We don't like that. Number two, severe corneal edema from long excessive surgery, because now we can't see what's happening to really make a determination. Number three, managing a retinal detachment with poor visualization and a poorly implanted IOL. That is something that we absolutely hate. But there's the other part, a cataract surgeon requesting the complication be undisclosed to the patient. I have a, I do not accept this. And I learned over the years that there's some cataract surgeons that will do that. I don't work with them. We want to be able to be, I will disclose, he will disclose, everything will go fine. When I get a phone call, it's like, don't tell him this. Listen, man, uh, you can work with somebody else. I, I, I don't do that. Uh, anxious cataract surgeon that requests immediate vitrectomy, sometimes when the patient doesn't need it, that's a problem. Recognize that there's plans and protocols to follow for the be best outcome. You don't have to have the vitrectomy done and have us jump in like Batman uh, one minute after the, after the, the castle tear happened. Or the opposite. One is that you must do something surgery now, or the opposite is late referral after chronic changes have ensued. And, and then at that point, you're putting us in a situation we cannot fix the situation. I've had patients with chronic retinal detachment, with RK incisions, with macular edema, and a multifocal IOL. And I fix the retinal detachment, the patient has a 2050 outcome, and the patient's pissed. And I'm like, there's only so much that I can do, you know? Uh, so. When I see these patients referred to me, I have my examination checklist. Of course, everybody examines, but what am I looking for? Vitreous to the wound, integrity of the lens anterior capsular rim, severity of inflammation and intraocular pressure. I always examine the inferior, the peripheral vitreous is where everything lies because gravity will take it there. That's where you'll find the small little pieces of nucleus or lens material. If you don't see it, lean the patient back and then look into the vitreous again because that's where pieces or or intraocular lenses kind of come back where you can see them. Then I ask myself, how dense and large is the nucleus fragment? And a very important question, is there choroidal effusion? And I'll go back to that in a second. If I get an OCT, is there macular edema or traction that we have to handle? That's my personal checklist. Because I'm trying to answer these questions. Do I, can I remove this lens fragment with a little fragmentome? I mean, with vitreous cut or do I need the, the fragmentome? Do I need to replace or reposition, reposition the intraocular lens? Uh, should I place a secondary IOL as a patient is apacic? Do I need to manage some macular pathology while I'm there? And I always assume that there's a retinal tear. That I begin with the assumption that if the patient had a problem, there's a retinal tear somewhere. And I'm going to be looking for it. Uh, so switching perspectives. So we're talking about hypotony. So choroidal effusion is something that people don't think much about. And it's very common after complicated cataract surgery when there's intraoperative or post-op hypotony. By the way, post-op is important as well if you don't have, if you have a leaking wound or, you know, you have a problem, you know, the, the wound is, you know, burned or what have you. Uh, and the issue here, best approach is to observe and avoid delay vitrectomy. If there's a leak, close it. You want a normal intraocular pressure. Low intraocular pressure in these situations can be bad. When you do a, when you try to do a surgery in these patients and you go in behind the iris to the pars plana, your pars plana cannula can end up in a supracoroidal space and you can end up supracoroidal infusing um, or the vitreous carnal can cause peripheral retinal tears. So this is, this is a real problem um, when you're trying to deal with them. How about intraocular lens placement? This is something that sounds a little absurd, but I want to remind people that a fakia is curable and temporary. The goal of cataract surgery is not defined by lens implantation. You can always put a lens later after the rest of the ocular structures are managed and stable. Doing vitrectomy surgery, a secondary IOL should be the last step, not the primary step. First deal with the eye integrity, then consider the refractive part. Because you can end up with situations like this. A poorly placed IOL may become a problem for years. And it's sometimes best to delay implantation until you can actually see how you can best uh, have the best optimal results. Um, and this is one of the issues, the one piece versus three piece IOLs. When complications arise, if you're not sure, please put a three piece IOL unless you're absolutely sure, because we can reposition them, suture them, sclerofixate them much better than a one, IOL, one piece IOL. Let's think about this example. 
I don't think of this as a disaster, even though a lot of my friends would. The surgeon detected a posterior capsular tear. He did a small anterior vitrectomy performed by the phaco surgeon. He basically cleared the anterior chamber for vitreous, put the lens into the, into the sulcus, and got the heck out. He calls me later with the patient like this. I went in, did a vitrectomy, cleared this up. There was no problem with the retina. Final visual outcome, 2020 patient happy. This is not a disaster. This was managed well. Everybody has complications, okay? Let's go back to the chordal effusions. What happens with chordal effusions leads me to the worst of the worst, which is when you have stretching of these chordal vessels, and some these chordal vessels sometimes are atherosclerotic on our older patients. This is when the vessels break and you have a supercortical hemorrhage like this. Supercortical hemorrhage is something that we can all agree that is something bad, you know? This is the prototypical kissing chordals that we'll talk a little bit about in a second. Um, so a hemorrhagic chordal detachment, you know, it's a hemorrhage in the supercortical space between the core and the sclera. The old term is the expulsive hemorrhage. And this is a term that was used when you had a big incision surgery and then you basically bled and because there's no tamponading of the pressure, basically the intraocular contents expulsed out of the eye in a little volcano. Uh, this happened during extracapsular, intracapsular cataract surgery, happens much less common now with phaco because of small incisions. But obviously this is, this is bad. Um, what is the role of hypotony? And this is going back to what Ike was saying. Intraocular pressure, when it's higher than the intraocular, intracortical pressure higher than the, the intraocular uh, pressure, leads to serous coral detachments, stretching of the cortical vessels. Oftentimes the patient does some valsalva and then boom, bleeding uh, secondary to that. Remember that all bleeding stops. An acute cortical hemorrhage continues until the intraocular pressure is higher than the vascular pressure. The expulsive hemorrhages occur because the intraocular pressure is zero. And, and basically just keeps on, keeps on bleeding into the supercortical space. Um, I do have a belief, this is not well described in the ophthalmic literature, but I strongly believe that there's two types of supercortical hemorrhages. There's venous and arterial. When you look at our neurosurgical bodies, they look at their subdural hemorrhages and epidural hemorrhages as you know, venous or, or, or arterial. I think there's a difference here because the arterial hemorrhages are the ones that are most fulminant with uh, super elevated intraocular pressures and problems. The arterial supercortical hemorrhage comes in with in sudden intense intraocular pain after surgery, oftentimes. This is what the, the, the trabeculectomy patients that comes in and calls you afterwards. It's a thunderclap headache, is in the differential diagnosis. Remember that the bleeding stops when the intraocular pressure is high enough that's above the, the vascular cortical pressure. They have a shallow anterior chamber, kissing choroidals. And here's the thing, the severe vision loss actually occurs from vascular hyperperfusion of the retina and nerve when the pressure is that high. It's not the hemorrhage that happens, it's the pressure. The venous coral pre uh, supercoral hemorrhages are not as severe. And, and here's the cor corollaries to this in terms of management. The final visual loss after a supercoral hemorrhage is dependent of the, in the intraocular pressure and the perfusion of both the nerve and the retina more than the presence of, of these uh, hemorrhages. The damage oftentimes has occurred by the time the patient arrives for examination. Early surgical drainage is only useful in the hyperacute phase. So when you're in the middle of surgery and you have an intraocular uh, supercortical hemorrhage, the first step is manage the pressure. Close the wounds if you can, suture the wounds, inject something into the eye, increase the pressure of the eye to stop the hemorrhage. And if it's acutely, you know what you're doing, you can do a scleral cut down. The scleral cut down won't work two hours later. It, it only works when you have it on the spot. How about this issue about the kissing choroidals? It's certainly a worse visual prognosis uh, and it's usually arterial with a mass effect. Now, it's not well understood because uh, this concept has been said that kissing choroidals lead to retinal retinal adhesions uh, um, and, and that really doesn't happen. Uh, and so people look at this and say, well, we have to drain them if they're touching, but if they're barely touching, we don't have to drain them. Uh, there's no pathophysiology to explain retina to retina adhesions. Kissing corridors is not what we used to think about it. The true pathophysiology is that there's a sudden collapse of the vitreous body due to this corridor mass effect. There's a change in the macromolecular you know, composition of the, of, of the vitreous in the conformation of the collagen fibers. And as the corridor elevation recedes, the collapsed vitreous base doesn't re-expand. The vitreous stays up in the front, causing vitreous traction, 
into the peripheral retina, which leads to retinal detachments and cyclic membrane formation, the two bad things. So what are the corollaries to that conceptual difference? That the drainage of the massive corridors is important to prevent that vitreous contraction. Whether the retina is truly making out with the other retina or just basically about to. It, whether they're totally kissing or close to kissing, for me, it's irrelevant. It's about the mass effect, not about the retinal contact. The drainage of supercortical hemorrhage, timing. The best timing is 10 to 14 days because it allows the liquefaction of that solid blood clot and the PVR contraction hasn't set phase. If you want to go through the basically do a vitrectomy, I do not recommend this. I do not recommend a vitrectomy approach to supercortical hemorrhage because you can go through the peripheral retina when that, remember that the hemorrhage goes all the way to the scleral spur. I just simply do a simple supercortical hemorrhage of debulking of the supercortical space with a little drainage and there will remain some blood in there and that's okay. It's basically debulking, not removing everything. Uh, I don't want to go too long. Ultimately, this is, by the way, this is a great photo of a supercortical drainage hemorrhage. Of course, this patient was super anticoagulated, so it made the, the photo quite, quite interesting, but this is the things that we're worried about. Remember, it's associated to hypotony, so management of the hypotony is the way to avoid and, and manage uh, the supercortical hemorrhage at first. And ultimately, finishing up here, the only surgeon that doesn't have complications is the one that doesn't perform surgery. If you're in the operating room, you will eventually have a complication. And it's how a surgeon manages a complication that defines whether he or she is a good surgeon. It, and that's a way to think about this in general. So um, any questions, comments, discussions, guys? Thanks so much, Jordy. That, that, was, uh, that was really comprehensive. I, I, I just want to make a few comments and I think there's some probably some questions on the chat group that may come up as well. That, some of some of them have answered. Havo, thanks for answering them as well. Gustavo, I think you're here as well. Um, so I, I think the hypotony thing is is an important thing. I think you mentioned, of course, one of the extreme situations that occurs when you get a you know choroidal detachment or an effusion. But even beyond that, of course, I think you know in terms of destabilizing the anterior segment, you know, some blood aqueous disruption when you when you stretch those vessels, um, and and of course even potentially having vitreous that may prolapse for it. I mean, those are all things that even in a subtle case. Um, sometimes you miss. So I think it's just generally good habits. I see people do great phaco and then they come out of the eye, even the, or the vitrectomy anteriorly, right? And they come out of the eye yeah. and then the eye's shallowing, right? At the end of the case. And I'm like, well, you just said a whole vitrectomy here. Now the yeah. chamber's shallowing. And so um, I, I can't tell you how common that is. And I think maybe because people are doing vitrectomy and are thinking, oh, I've, done, I've done a vitrectomy now, nothing's going to come forward again. Well, of course it's going to fall negative pressure and you haven't done a full vitrectomy, of course. You got anterity, so don't be afraid to inject viscoelastic again. People are afraid of pressure spikes, and I get that, but you can manage and mitigate that, or you can remove viscoelastic more controlled without using automation if you if you wish, and then keep that chamber form. Suture your wounds, go back with a syringe and inject and irrigate. The OVDL it takes a longer time, but man, it saves you doing more vitrectomy and of course bigger I, complications. I so. agree. I would rather see a pressure of forty that you have to handle that than a very low pressure and have a supercortical hemorrhage or any of the other complications that happen. So I agree that you have to be very careful. In, in, the, in, the, in the fog of war, in the middle of the surgery, sometimes people stop thinking about that. But I agree with you. And this is the point that when you find yourself in trouble, it's never bad to suture and refill the eye. And as I said, use air if you're not sure. Air will always work in your favor. And it's a lot cheaper if you're worried about breaking open a bunch of you know, uh, OVDs. I, I think that's the concern I think people have is I got to open another viscoelastic up and now can I get away without it, man? And I think I just seen so many things, even pediatric eyes, you know, you do a beautiful job. You take the, hit the OVD out. You did a nice posterior capsular rexus in a capture and these uh, studs are so elastic. Boom. Shallows yeah. up and you got vitreous and it totally changed the game. So, uh, you know, as I saw in the video there, I just remove it manually and, and you can manage the pressure. You can see them back in a few hours. You can, I put them on zolomide, multiple doses if you're worried, you know, um, use some myostat if you're worried, diluted. So there are ways to mitigate that. So this is just a plea, and I'm a glaucoma specialist, so I, I, I'm the one who doesn't like high pressure, and I'm suggesting I agree with you. You can tolerate that pressure for some time, and I think that's a better way to go. Yeah. Uh, Gustavo. Actually, we have much more tools to deal with a high IOP than with lower IOP, because when you have the choroidal detachment, what can you do? You have to wait 
or you can do the drainage, but you don't have many option, options left. Sorry. So as you said, air is not that, that expensive. You can inject it. And even when you see some vitrectomy, some colleagues doing vitrectomies, that the incisions are not well sealed and you see some gas escaping, they say, no, 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 it's okay, it's stop, okay. But yeah. the IOP is gone, it's mm -hmm. gone. You're gonna have the choroidal detachment almost 100% um, sure. And, <clears throat> and going, back to, going back to the issue of the viscoelastic, for example, I have no trouble if a patient gets sent to me and is hypotenuse early after surgery, just right there in the slit lamp or in your office procedure room, inject viscoelastic in the anterior chamber. Just let that pressure go up if you haven't had a horrible supracortal hemorrhage, if there's just, an, just basically a serious cortical detachment in, in, in hypotony, just inject some viscoelastic, temporize it and avoid a disaster. Or if pressure goes off, well, you know it can happen. You can watch that patient carefully and you can treat it. Follow him. Absolutely, absolutely. Just um, a question. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to see if there's any other points about here. Uh, there was just uh, some questions that came up, and however, you may want to take this one here, just around, uh, you know, PC opening, uh, you know, putting it in the bag or not. I mean, what kind of principles do you use to decide whether to put an eye well in the bag? Um, and if you do, do you do a three-piece or one-piece? So, you know, you are the master of the IOL, so I will I will <laughs> let you analyze what IOL you put. From my perspective, the bigger issue is how the vitreous is handled, you know? Because sometimes, not sometimes, very often, I feel that inexperienced surgeons put too much emphasis on the intraocular lens. And as I said, they feel that, oh, it looked bad, but I put the lens in, I'm good. And then that's not the case. You first manage the vitreous loss, you first manage the problem. Then secondarily, you say, okay, first, can I put the IOL now? If you're not sure, don't put it. There's nothing wrong on putting a secondary IOL a few weeks later. It, it'll be okay, you know? The problem is putting a lens in a bad situation and now you have to deal with that. So yeah, if, if the situation allows you to put a good, nice one piece IOL in the bag, if you've done a posterior capsular rexus, if you, if, if, you, if you know how to do that and you're comfortable, sure, no problem. But just don't push yourself to do so because you told the patient that you wanted to put a multifocal IOL and, and et cetera, et cetera. And I'll let you talk about a decenter multiple coil well more than, because I don't know about that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. Um, I think we, you need to avoid, for those, for all the Latin American uh, people here, we, we, we have a joke, uh, lente aunque reviente. You want to try to avoid that. And for the non-science seekers, that's like a poetic way and it rhymes and it basically says, like jam a lens in even if the eye explodes. It doesn't really work when you translate it, but lente aunque reviente, don't do that. Um, yeah, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, to uh, to answer the the question about the, the specific question about a very small circular hole in a PC uh, in a stable eye. Um, yes, you can uh, place a single piece uh, acrylic IOL in the bag. Key point here is if you notice that hole, uh, make sure you do a little bit of tamponade with OVD, and this is like a very thin line between adding too much OVD and overfilling the eye and causing more problems and just putting enough dispersive OVD through that little uh, hole to tamponade um, the vitreous from coming back into the, into the PC. If you have vit prolapsing into the anterior chamber, you need to clear that before you put a lens in. So that's, we saw some examples where Jordy showed uh, vitreous entrapment in all kinds of places. So you wanna try to avoid that. But if you have a small PC hole with no vitreous prolapse, maybe intact anterior hyaloid. You can do a very gentle filling of your uh, bag with, with a cohesive OVD and, and then make sure that you don't have any anterior chamber shallowing because that will cause extension of the hole into a large tear and vitreous prolapse. And yes, you can place a single piece IOL <coughs> in the bag. I like to suggest that this be done only and exclusively if you have a round rexus that is under uh, five millimeter or around five millimeters, because in the event that when you're implanting your single piece acrylic lens, you end up extending the tear, you can always reverse optic capture the optic in such a way where the haptics are still in the bag and the optic is anteriorly captured in your, in your, in your, in your TCC. If you have a very large rexus or an irregular rexus or a capsule tear and anterior capsule tear and a small PC tear, then I would not implant a single piece acrylic lens. 
go for a three piece as well. So there's there's a number of questions that I want to uh, address while I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, there's a question about anti anticoagulation. I do not stop anticoagulation. I do not stop uh, antiplatelets. Uh, and I do retroborbital blocks on all my patients, whereas you guys are doing, um, you know, mostly topical surgery for these patients. So, I mean, as long as the patient is not way over anticoagulated, it's not an issue. Uh, regarding the ACIOLs, every time we bring up ACIOLs, we are bound to have a fight. <laughs> I, <laughs> yes. I, I think that AC, my general thought is that ACIOLs sometimes are a marker for a bad surgery rather than intrinsically bad. Meaning a lot of the patients have ACIOLs and problems are not because of the ACIOL, are because of the problem that led to the ACIOL being placed. Now, it is true that an ACIOL can damage, uh, you know, the corneal endothelium. And uh, the way I look at it is you're trying to make a question about what's going to last longer, the myocardium or the corneal endothelium. So in other words, I'm perfectly fine putting an ACIOL on an 80-year-old patient, but I'm not fine putting an ACIOL on a 20-year-old patient. That's a, a concept. So I think ACIOLs do have a role, but they have to be used appropriately and, and in the right patient selection. And as I said earlier, please don't put them primarily because you probably are jumping the gun on that. Um, there's another question over here about uh, leave a faking the patient or put the IOL. Listen, it, it really depends on your your your, your um, retina guy. I'm very comfortable putting uh, secondary IOLs, and I think a lot of retina people are very comfortable putting uh, secondary IOLs. But I also know some uh, some retina guys that don't put AC IOLs, and you gotta have a communication with the individual doctor that you're working with. I, for example, would much rather be sent a patient a phakic with a drop nucleus than a patient with a bad IOL placement and a drop nucleus. Because I can handle that vitreous and clean it up much better and, and do a much better situation. And then after I'm done, I can put a lens wherever the heck I want to put the lens. That's my preference. But I know some guys that would rather have the IOL placed. And I would say, if you're going to put the lens, the intraocular lens, make sure you've done a proper management of the vitreous before you put the lens. Uh, you, I know you guys have thoughts about that. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I'm not, I'm not so against ACI wells. I mean, I think that sizing is always important. And I think, you know, most of us in the OR only have one or two sizes available. And if, if the eye is small AC or large AC, then that eye, ACL could cause a problem. And I would honestly, and I have done it myself, I leave the patient a fake it and come back and do something else afterwards. Agreed. I mean, I don't, I really don't think there's a, Again, talk about ego and everything else. I, I, in my career, I mean, working myself or residents and fellows, I've left eyes aphakic unplanned, probably at least five or six times. Yeah. Um, and I've explained it. And they do well. Why. Yeah. You know, I mean, yes, yeah, it's not comfortable. Patients are not seeing, of course, and everything else, but not having to manage a complication and then being able to go in shortly after to get it done right. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely reasonable to do that. So on the other hand, if you have an older patient and it's a usual size eye and you put the ACI well in and it, sizes nicely, the pupil's not peaked, it's not spinning around. I, I think that can be well tolerated for a long time for, for these patients. So I probably wouldn't do it for a really young patient, mind you, but I mean, otherwise, it, I think it's reasonable to do that. I think it's fine. Yeah, it's, um, as I said, it's myocardium versus endothelium. <laughs> I like that, that's, that's funny. <laughs> well, um, we have another question here. Yes. Um, any, any tips to remove cortex after anterior vitrectomy in the case of a PCR? So yeah, that's a really good point. If you're already doing an anterior vitrectomy, and you're clearing vitreous away from your AC or your wounds or, or even the bag. Um, remember that you can deactivate the cut mode in your vitrector. So you can go to either IA cut, which means that your step two aspirates and then step three cuts, versus cut IA, which means your step two on your pedal cuts first and then aspirates on step three. Or some other machines, you can just deactivate the cut. So if you deactivate the cut, your vitrectomy probe turns into a, uh, an IA probe. And you can switch around back and forth from cutting and non-cutting to finish aspirating your cortex from the bag. And the moment you entrap vitreous, you go back to cut, cut that vitreous up, clean up a little bit more, and then go back and aspirate that cortex. Another great way is if, if there's no vitreous left in the bag and you've cleared the vitreous out of the way, you can use a manual technique using a 27-gauge cannula, and you manually aspirate the cortex slowly uh, in a very controlled fashion through a very small incision. And you basically uh, aspirate a small amount, 
uh, take the cannula out of the eye, squirt that vitreous out, refill your AC with BSS slowly, and then go back. It takes time, but it's a really nice, clean way to clean that up. I want to say something about handling the vitrectomy because uh, most interior saving guys are not used to handling the vitreous near the iris. And I will tell you, uh, the vitrectomy port loves iris. Yes, it's, it just yes. loves cutting and eating iris. So one of the ways when you're not using this, and by the way, the interior segment uh, cutters just have much slower cutter. I mean, we're, I'm working with 15,000 cuts a minute right now when I'm doing interior, uh, my, my vitrectomy stuff. And I'm not sure what, what the current machines do, but I would say, you know, I'm trying to see if I can show myself here, go sideways. So this is, if this is your oh, capsule, instead of bringing the vitreous cutter this way, go sideways. And that way you're avoiding eating the iris, which oftentimes happens, particularly when you're kind of nervous and doing this thing. Eat it sideways and then absolutely go down to get the vitreous, sideways to get the cortex. And you can alternate between these two. Just don't go up where you're gonna start going at the iris. Yeah, those are great pearls. Uh, I mean, Gustavo, what, what, how, what do you think about if someone's doing an anti retractomy put an infusion line in and have a second instrument to move the iris away, for example? I mean, some people do that. I, I mean, AC maintainers do add extra incisions or using the irrigation cannula to kind of act as a second instrument to kind of push away uh, mm -hmm. iris. I mean, any tips for for uh, for VIT, for anterior segment surgeons? Absolutely. First of all, I think you guys have already said, which is close the main incision. If you need, actually myself, I like to suture it, to don't feel tempted to use it, okay? <laughs> and use paracentesis. So you're gonna have a stable anterior chamber, which will make your life much easier because if you're using the main incision, you'll have uterus coming and coming because it's a, it's a pressure balance. So if you have both chambers or both segments with a balance of pressure, it will be easier for you to work. Uh, I don't see many pre people avoid using infusion lines uh, with BSS. I don't see any problem if the eye is closed. So the thing is, Jorge already said, Jordan already said that the, the vitrectum loves to eat the iris, so have it pointing to the center. So if you have the pupil here, the, always pointing to the center of the pupil so you won't eat the iris. That's the best way to do it. And another thing, <clears throat> oh, very important, when you are using BSS, lower bottle, okay? If you have it too high, you're gonna increase the pressure of the BSS and bring more vitreous. So that's one thing. And if you're afraid that the BSS will bring more vitreous upwards, I have no problem using air. I use lots of air with vitreous and a spatula and slowly, very gentle. Again, I'm going to be uh, very repetitive with this. Watch out if you're not inducing traction. Use a spatula very slowly, clean the main incision because it's very common to have vitreous in the main incision. And then again, start air. I think it was Canabrava here from Brazil who presented the vitreous bubble technique. You inject air in the vitreous chamber and the air will come up and will block the vitreous passage. So it's a lot of few tips and it takes time to learn. So if you're starting, don't worry if you don't, it, if you don't do it right at the beginning. It takes time to learn and to manage and to, to control these techniques. Remember that air by definition stays on the top. Almost yes. everything else, including the viscoelastic, will tend to go down because of gravity. So air will be on top and by definition, the vitreous will have to give, be going underneath it. And I'll add another thing, Jordi, sorry, that air exists. People think that be, on, where there is air, there is nothing. No, that is vacuum, okay? <laughs> air has, occupies the space. Think about it, because people say think that if they can't see, it doesn't exist. It's not that, like that. It doesn't exist. Love it. <laughs> so just a question that people ask, I mean, do you, do, I mean, do you need to use a filter when you take air from the room and inject it in the AC? Not really. I, I mean, don't see any problem. Never yeah, I mean, it. when we're doing a fluid gas exchange, okay. uh, it's a little bit different. The the volumes are higher, um, but but I, I've I've used air many times in situations, and I just get it from room air. The operating room should be pretty darn clean, frankly. You know, it's not sterile, but but I really rarely have any problems. But you think about it, you're making an open incision in a patient's belly or thorax. You've got air there. You know, so mm -hmm. so that air is not sterile air. Uh, I guess in COVID days, now they're using like the negative pressure brooms. You can have air from the outside. But let me put it this way. I've used air many times. I've never had enough amides from that. If you have a, 
a um, what we call it a filter to filter air. Sure, um, that's even better, you know. But just remember, when you use filter, you got to take the filter out to inject. Otherwise, you're putting the the, the, the yeah. stuff back in. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a rookie mistake right there, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm the same way. I, I uh, like I showed in that picture earlier. I mean, I, I love having air. I think, you know, it helps to kind of even at the end of the case, just see how much OVD is left in the eye, you know, and you can kind of see an air fluid the meniscus almost. And so it has better surface tension, of course, so it can, you know, hold things a bit. If you have a lot of positive pressure, of course, it not, it's not necessarily going to hold, but it can certainly maintain uh, space in a normal environment. So I totally agree. Uh, that's great. Um, maybe just one more question that's come up here. Maybe how you want to take this one? This is a question regarding um, iris prolapse. Um, yeah. Managing iris prolapse. I, I will say that I think I still see, despite all the teaching out there now, that people, I, I think, don't manage iris prolapse very well. And we often think, ah, you know what? Like the retina guys, they do this all the time. They, ah, you got some iris, you got some iris transluminescent defects. Big deal, man. I mean, it's like a little translumination and no problem for the patient. But, and it can be no problem, but sometimes patients get really bothered by photophobia and things like that and just photopsies, totally. you know, uh, any thoughts uh, about just managing iris prolapse and avoiding it? Yeah. I mean, the best advice I can give you to uh, manage iris prolapse is to avoid it. Yeah. And <laughs> yes. For sure. And the, the best way to avoid it, first of all, is to make sure that your incision is not too posterior um, because you're basically opening the door for the iris to prolapse out of your wound. So if you have a very posterior, very limbal and very short incision, you're going to have iris prolapse. The second most important point is to avoid overfilling the eye with OVD because everything is a pressure gradient. And if the IOP is extremely high, that pressure is going to be higher than the outside of the room and your iris is going to prolapse. Third key point is make sure that you are not exchanging instruments with high pressure inside the eye. So whether it's a lot of OVD in the eye or, for example, a lot of people pull out of the eye with their FACO in step one, so still irrigating, the hose is open, and what happens when you're, if you've ever connected a garden hose and the tap is still open and you try to disconnect the hose, you're going to get splashed in the face. So that's going to be iris prolapsing all over again. So make sure you exit the eye in step zero. Give it a few seconds for the pressure to drop down a little bit and then pull your phaco prolapse. Now, if you've had iris prolapse, do not try to push the iris back into the wound because you're only going to hurt that iris. That iris is popping out because of the reasons that I've already stated. So the best thing you can do is use another wound to lower the pressure. So burp some OVD out or burp some BSS out of the eye. And once the pressure is lower, most of the time that iris is just gonna slowly flop back into the eye. And if it doesn't, once the pressure is very low, then you can go in through another wound and gently sweep that iris to allow it to flop back to where it belongs. The iris will want to go back. If the pressure is low, it will want to go back to where it belongs. But if the pressure is high, it's going to go out the door. Those are my best tips. Great tips. Great tips. Well, listen, we have a special visitor here. We have Anna. Anna Silvia Serrano. Do you know who she is? How do you know who she is? Yeah, yeah, of course. Hey. Mexican, like Mexican, but she's hey. not really Mexican anymore. Yeah, we're, you, man. We, want to see, we want to see you, man. We, this is like a male, too much male bonding yeah. here, man. We need, some, we need some wisdom here. You're saving the presentation. Thanks, God. Yeah. Let me just fix my camera here. So Anna's, Anna's uh, hey, how are you? Nice to see you. And I'm Hi. glad that she doesn't have a beard. <laughs> I don't have a beard. And I'm in my pages, but, 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 but thanks for the invitation, though. Hey, we're, 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 all, we're, all, we're all pretty casual. You know that. So uh, you know, Anna, Anna trained in, uh, in Mexico, and she's done a fellowship in Cornea in Barranquilla in Colombia. Uh, and she's always a uh, regular attendee at, uh, at the meetings and webinars. Always mm -hmm. nice to see you. So thanks for joining us. We thought we would, we thought we would, we would finish off with, um, with something from you that you may want to share about uh, cataract and your learnings or your pearls. I mean, you, you know, you're, you're your own webinar celebrity. You've been speaking at Latin meetings. I wanted you to speak at one of our meetings here. Well, First of all, I think that like the first thing that comes to mind when you have like an iris prolapse, like how I was saying, it's to put more viscoelastic in. So you have to avoid that immediately yeah. and try to uh, check the IOP in those sites because mo most of the time they, their IOP is really, really high and you have to do something about it. Just like you said, just ch check the OVD. And if, if that iris, pro it, it, like, especially in IFIS, 
if that iris, iris, iris prolapse is very constant, I recommend to close that wound and make another wound. Don't fight with that incision. I love that pearl, and I, and I think that's that's part of the ego problem, right? We're like, oh, I can't make another incision, and uh, and that can so nicely solve that problem. I totally, I totally agree. I don't know, Gustavo, you were gonna you were gonna ask something. I don't know if you were. Yeah, actually, one thing I really like to do uh, because sometimes it's really difficult to keep the anterior chamber stable. You enter through the paracentesis with the spatula, and parallel to the main incision you bring the iris back very gently. So you're not touching the main incision and it will keep there if you have a self-sealing incision. There was a couple of questions uh, that came up maybe while we have you here, Anna, and also others as well. When, when you have like positive pressure, you have the chambers like, you know, shallowing and what are your, what are kind of your immediate steps uh, in, in managing it? You know, when you have the situation where you have the, you know, you're operating and then all of a sudden you get this or whatever, gradually you get this increased you know, pressure from the back of the eye and any, any, any kind of work, any thought process in terms of what you think about first and, and manage it accordingly. I don't know, Anna, if you wanted to take that one or Havo, both of you, either one. Yeah, the sure. Retina, the retina guys, of course, have all the answers. So we'll wait, we'll leave them to the end. <laughs> you have to think that something bad, like down there is going on. You gotta, you gotta think about, um, like expulsive hemorrhage, anything that uh, malignant glaucoma. You have to think your, your 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 mind has to go straight that something bad is happening. You have to act fast. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that's true. How, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, you're absolutely right. Those are the things we worry about. And I know it's interesting. A lot of people say, oh, well, how can you get malignant glaucoma? But I totally agree with you, Anna. I think you can get a phenomena that is, I guess we could call it like malignant glaucoma. And I call it intraoperative malignant, which is, uh, you know, kind of a variation. But what do you think, Havo? I mean, I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's right. How do you differentiate and how do you manage it? Because they both can be managed differently. Well, I think if, if you were able to go back and watch all of these videos where this happened, where you're, you know, you're operating and all of a sudden you just can't seem to keep your AC formed and you're, in, you're you know, you're, you're raising your bottle and you're injecting OVD and it, your end to your chamber just keeps shallowing. There's a, there's a posterior pushing mechanism here. And if you were to go back, there was probably a point where the AC shallowed and this caused choroidal expansion. And you're, you basically have the, the choroidal expanding into the vitreous and the vitreous gel has nowhere to go, but forward. And you have an open eye, so that's going to push all the acres out of your AC, and your and your AC will continuously shallow. So what you need to do here is, well, you, you first of all need to think about how you're going to reduce that posterior pressure. The best way to fix it permanently is to create a unicameral eye. So you need to think about doing an iridozonular high load of um, But you can start with simply a, an iridectomy and doing a very small uh, high load uh, zonulectomy. And a lot of the times that alone will allow for some fluid to pass from the posterior chamber into the anterior chamber. And a, a lot of times that will solve the problem. Another option is to do a very, very, very small vitrectomy uh, going into part plena and just removing a tiny little bit of fluid rather than vitreous or a very small amount of vitreous. I'm talking about two seconds on the pedal. And that's another option. But the permanent solution is creating a unicameral life through an IZH. And, and of course, Havel, of course, is referring to if you're sure you've ruled out, you've ruled out, uh, as, as Jordi mentioned earlier, you've ruled out a, a choroidal detachment or an, a fusion 100%. or a hemorrhage. And sometimes it's not so easy. Obviously, we hear about the most extreme example. You've got lots of red reflux, the patient's in severe pain. But everyone kind of reacts differently. And, um, and so some, you got to, I think, be mindful. Now, we're, we're lucky. We, we have an indirect ophthalmoscope in our OR, you know, so... I like to just stop, uh, you know, viscoelastic in the AC and get it out and look, right? I think that's, that's, that's kind of helpful to know that because you don't want to, what we never want to do is, I wouldn't want to do anyways, uh, maybe the R guys would, I don't, I don't want to do vitrectomy when there's a chordal detachment and a chordal Yeah, of course, absolutely. I think it's going to make it worse and you could end up causing much bigger problems, right, mm -hmm. Jordi? So. so a little a little tip about that. So, of course, I agree with everything you said about ruling out a supercoral hemorrhage. And, and the point is, if it's happening, it, it, rather than manipulating, your best approach is to come out, suture your wounds, and feel the pressure. Usually, usually that's the difference is whether it's high pressure or low pressure. Uh, but if you're talking about a case in which you basically have your fluid is going into the vitreous cavity, and I want to make a little point of if you're going to put a needle through the pars plana into the vitreous, a couple of points here, go all in. This is like crossing the street. 
you either stay on one side of the street or you go to the other side of the street. You don't stay in the middle of the street, you're gonna run over by a truck. Why is this? Because the, the, the vitreous base is thick enough. So you have to go through the vitreous base to know exactly what you're doing. So my advice is if you're gonna stick a needle, you can stick a 25 gauge needle. You usually don't have travel to do an actual vitrectomy if all you wanted is to change some of the fluid dynamics. If, because if you have this situation, there's a fluid pocket to go for. Stick your 25 gauge needle straight into basically mid pupillary point into the mid vitreous. You're gonna get a few drops of fluid. You can come out and you can keep on going that way. And, and just a point to mention, um, a couple of things I like to think about. If it's a gradual increase in the, or shallowing of the chamber, well, first of all, before that even, I like to kind of, I don't know about you guys, I'm gonna be Anna and others. I like to put the bed a little bit in reverse Trendelenburg, you know, and, and I like it for many reasons. And one of them is just, I think, less venous return. Uh, when we do mixed procedures, it's less bleeding from the Schrems canal, we see that. So that's one little thing, a tight speculum, patient squeezing, sometimes you can get that. Sometimes it shouldn't, it shouldn't be dramatic, but it can be a little bit. And then what was called fluid misdirection syndrome. And people often confuse fluid misdirection syndrome from the choroidal expansion of malignant glaucoma. And fluid misdirection syndrome typically happens in eyes that have weak zonules. You got fluid going around. It's excessive fluid for a longer case. And slowly you see the chamber getting shallow. It's a slow, not an acute. It's a slow increase. It could be something else. I agree. But, but that's often what happens in these cases with weak zonules. Iris coloboma you see sometimes in a smaller eye. And so that's one thing to keep in mind. And those, like I think, as you kind of said, Jordi, put OVD in the eye, put a suture in, even have them wait. And then you come back and then things are soft and they're fine again, right? So I think, I think as we mentioned earlier, there's no, no, no wrong thing in waiting a little bit, right? And just pausing and looking. Um, but, you know, yeah. And, and I think that there are eyes that are more susceptible, to, for example, to, you know, to a malignant glaucoma situation. And those typically you get, the classic example is you're doing fake, everything's fine. You come out of the eye, you don't, you get the chamber formed, you go back with the eye and all of a sudden the eye is hard again, hard now, right? And that's, that's, that's a situation where they've got a choroidal hemorrhage or detachment or they have malignant glaucoma. Most, most small eyes don't, my experience, maybe, I may, maybe my, my retina cause may disagree. You get choroidal detachments and hemorrhages usually in patients who have normal to longer eyes. Um, in smaller eyes, usually if I see it, you get more of an expansion phenomena, no obvious discrete choroidal. Mm -hmm. and so that's one thing that sometimes can you know be used to differentiate, um, but always, always, I think it's good to look at the fundus. I think I think it can't beat that, right? I mean, that gives yeah. you more reassurance. So, uh, re really good, really good discussion on that one. It doesn't happen often. When it does, it can be a killer, right? You know, and uh, a lot of people think, oh my god, I'm leaving the cataract in the eye. The eye's going to be toast tomorrow. There's no. no rush. I mean, I I waited on eyes all the time with the cataracts aborted, and I wait for a few days or a week even. And you can kind of let the eye settle down even. So there's no problem with two steps. I think that's a, I think this is a common theme we're hearing. And I agree with Jordi here on that, on that comment and Gustavo as well. So um, those are just some points I would add. Anna, Anna what's uh, anything else you want to add before we, before we end the uh, webinar here, because we'll give the last word to you. Anything you want to share to the, share to the world from where are you? You're in uh, Barranquilla in your, in your apartment. Yes. You're gonna give me the last words. I feel honored. I, I, I am the guest, the guest speaker. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we, I I actually learned a lot with you today. So thank you very much for the effort I, uh, on making this. And well, please keep them coming because we don't want to stop watching your webinars. No, thank you. That's very that's very nice of you to say that. And 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 on that note, we are assessing what we're gonna do with the webinars. Uh, we probably will go down to once a week. We have to figure the right time. So. Um, you know, we, we will we will reach out to you who've been part of the webinars and we'd like to know what the best time and day is for you because I think it's becoming less and less, uh, you know, available when people are working. Are you working, Anna? Are you guys back to work in general? Are you, are you what's the situation in Colombia? Well, mostly uh, urgencies, but, but starting June 1st, I think it's going to go back mostly um, like normal stuff, surgery and stuff. Yeah, like a lot of us. Awesome, guys. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, always great. I mean, wonderful discussion and presentation. Jordi, thank you so much for being here again and presenting. You're always welcome to be uh, part of anything that, that I do, certainly, and always enjoy the collaboration between the front and the back. Obviously, we're always leading with the front. You guys are backing us up. Thank you. Um, and Gustavo, thank you very much uh, for everything you've done. You know, if you haven't followed Gustavo, follow him. Follow Jordi, of course, but everyone follows Jordi already. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I follow him. He's very popular. 
Uh, but Gustavo is uh, is also a wonderful teacher, as you've seen, and put putting together some pretty cool, innovative webinars. And so I, I know you're going to continue that that theme. So keep that up, uh, Havo. You know, it's all you know. It always reminds me of all the great teamwork we have together, man, and um, and how we can uh, you know come together and and learn and learn from each other and teach. And you've been such a great you know, a leader in that you've blossomed into a great, uh, you know, a great clinician and teacher. So thank you. Uh, and we do have a very strong Latin flavor here. I mean, uh, I, you know, people often ask me, do I have any Latin blood? But I'm sure as Anna and Hav and others will tell you that when they see me dance, they realize that there's no <laughs> Latin blood in there at all. There's like zero Latin blood in there because uh, the fact that I cannot roll my R's and I cannot uh, dance basically tells you that I have zero Latin blood. I wish, but I don't. So that's basically what I would say for that one. So uh, I bid again, uh, you know, safe uh, evening and um, and great time to be together. We'll be back in touch soon. See you again. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks great everybody. Thank you. Thank you. It was very amazing. Much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good rest. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.